The following is part of Cornell Contemporary China Initiative Lecture Series under the Cornell East Asia Program. The arguments and viewpoints of this talk belong solely to the speaker. We hope you enjoy. Welcome back to the Cornell Contemporary China Initiative. Uh, my name is Nick Edmondson. I'm the director of the CGCI and the assistant professor of Asian studies. Um, tonight, I am very, very happy to introduce uh, Professor Alan Carlson, who is Professor of Government uh, in the Department of Government at Cornell University, one of our own, um, and also director of the China Asia Pacific Studies Program. I know we have a lot of CAPS students in the audience today. Um, CAPS is also supporting this uh, this lecture, today's lecture. I see you guys smiling proudly at the CAPS students. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All awesome, good. Um, Alan's the author of a, an imperial bushel of research, um, as opposed to an American bushel, which I think is smaller. Um, uh, but I want to zoom in for a second on his uh, um, 2008 book called Unifying China, Integrating with the World, um, which uh, I think taught the field a lot of things about sovereignty. A lot of people had said or felt that sovereignty was very important to the Chinese government, but I think very few people understood how much it changes over time um, before Professor Carlson's research period, um, which makes him, and because um, national policy uh, towards sovereignty affects uh, international relations as well as domestic policy, that puts him in a great position to talk to us today about um, policy towards the Tibet Autonomous Region, um, which is what he's going to talk about today. Um, absolutely can't wait to hear this. I hope you're as excited as I am, and let's give him a, a warm welcome. Um, thank you, Nick, uh, and I want to thank the East Asia Program um, for putting together this amazing series. Um, and also do call attention to the CAPS program and its support of the series. Um, and if any of you are interested in learning more about China, uh, CAPS is a really great place to do so. Uh, whether you just take a class with us, uh, do the minor or the major, um, our offices are over in Morrill Hall. Um, come by, uh, and I'm happy to talk to you, talk to our staff as well. Um, as for today's talk, um, we're talking about one of the least sensitive issues in Chinese politics, she says sarcastically. Um, this, in fact, is probably one of the most sensitive topics when we're talking about China, as it is for all countries when, they, when the question of who belongs and where boundaries should be drawn um, becomes. So even before starting the talk, I just have a question for y'all. How many of you have been to Tibet? OK. How many of you have been to a Tibetan region within China? And uh, maybe those are the same things or not. Um, I uh, actually became a political scientist uh, after doing a semester with the School for International Training, a Tibetan Studies program when I was your age, uh, which took me to Dharamsala, Kathmandu, uh, Lhasa, uh, and also Sikkim. Um, and from that time, I was fascinated with this kind of question of where Tibet sat, both within China and within the international order. Uh, in my dissertation work, decades ago now, um, I looked at this issue with reference to the question of sovereignty, as Nick has said, uh, trying to figure out essentially kind of how Beijing was constructing its sovereign claims over Tibet, and in contrast, how some Tibetans, not all, uh, were forwarding a, a distinct narrative, their own narrative about Tibet as a separate place. From that early research to today, I've kind of emphatically stayed away from the question of which side is right. I don't find that normative question all that interesting. Um, rather, I'm looking at Tibet and its place in the world more analytically, um, trying to make sense of how and why we've gone from how things were to how they are, and looking forward a little bit to predicting the future. Um, so if at the end of the talk, um, any of you want to ask me, so should Tibet be independent? I will say I do not know. Uh, conversely, if any of you say, so Tibet is part of China, I will say, or do you agree? And I will say, I don't know. Um, in both cases, and, then, and we'll get to that in both cases, whether it's the Tibetan claim of independence or the Chinese claim of Tibet being a part of China, these are claims that are made within a Westphalian or sovereign order, uh, which has only existed in Asia from the end of the Qing, essentially. 
So relations before then, whether we're talking about where Tibet sat vis-a-vis -vis uh, vis -vis what was China then or Xinjiang, or even the relationship between countries there, or, or nations there, see, they're not even the right terms, dynasties, um, were more ambiguous uh, than what we have now. Uh, and so then to kind of go back and take our current system and, and kind of push it into that old order, I think creates a number of diff difficulties for anyone who's attempting to do it. Anyways, today I'm going to focus more on contemporary issues and particularly what I see and will document as a turn in uh, Beijing's policy towards minorities in general, Tibet and Xinjiang more specifically, shifting from a degree of there's always been a balance in Chinese policy uh, towards minorities between autonomy and assimilation. Uh, and over the past four or five years, the more assimilationist approach has dominated, has come to the fore in treatment of both uh, uh, Tibet and uh, Xinjiang, which I'm not as much of a specialist on. Uh, and one of the things that signals this, or one of the things where I, where I feel the level of this has gone beyond anything before, is in a recent drive to sinicize Zhongguo uh, Hua, uh, Tibetan Buddhism, Zhangtong uh, Guozhao, um, which is a new turn in religious policy and policy within the TAR. Uh, that will hi I'll highlight that towards the end of the talk. Also, then you see the quote below, which I haven't translated: "Shang Shi Liu Zi Neang Jin Jin Bao Zai Yi Ji." So even if you're not a speaker of Chinese. Um, you'll understand the image there. Um, this is an image of what? A pomegranate, a shuliotsu. And the seeds within a pomegranate, like you, we drink, people drink those like pom pom drinks, right? Which are pomegranates. I've never had one because they're like $5 a piece or something. <laughs> it seems incredibly expensive. Um, but the point here is when you cut open a pomegranate, um, the seeds are pretty much right on top of each other. Right? They're squeezed together. All right? Xi Jinping, when he was addressing the 19th uh, Party Congress, used this reference to talk about how nationalities in China should be interacting with each other today. They should be like the seeds within a pomegranate, squeezed together. This was in 2017, and I'll come around to this later in the talk. But I think it really um, uh, represents this shift away from autonomy. There's still vestiges of autonomy uh, within um, to, uh, Chinese policy towards Tibet, but towards more a more assimilationist approach. So setting the stage for current Southern Tibetan relations, um, as I was just talking about, what we had historically were two empires um, who interacted with each other in, in various ways that kind of waxed and waned depending on which it was more powerful. There are some seminal events uh, within the Sino-Tibetan relationship which are referred to by both sides, both the Tibetans and the Chinese, as symbolizing or representing moments of either independence or belonging to uh, a, a Chinese order. I'm not going to go into those today. Um, actually, I'm giving, it just so happens this week, I'm doing two talks on Tibet. Um, on Thursday, I'm giving a talk to the Repi Institute, which will focus much more on this kind of question of international order and how it's created at different points in time. And during that talk, I will, uh, for instance, uh, go into detail about the fifth Dalai Lama's um, uh, trip to Beijing um, in uh, the six, 1600s, it was, uh, when he meets with the Xinjiang Emperor, uh, Xinjiang, uh, the uh, Emperor of the Qing, um, and a kind of question of what type of protocol and order was followed, or subsequently later in the Qing, um, the institution of the use of the golden urn uh, as a way to uh, select reincarnates. Um, leaving all that aside, what's, what's quite clear, the details aside, what's clear is that historically, it was, uh, uh, as Michael Oxenberg wrote in one of the last pieces he did before he died a decade ago, um, it was a, a multi-layered relationship. So in, in that multi-layered relationship, again, we're talking about a pre-Westphalian order in this part of Asia. So, so you, to take concepts um, that we now are familiar with, whether it's independence or sovereignty, any of those, and project them back is then to kind of take that old order and fit it into a set of categories that we 
understand, um, but that will then leave out parts of what was going on at the time. Okay, so it's a, does, uh, in my in my mind, it does an injustice to the complexity of the dynastic relationship uh, between those in Tibet and in China itself. Um, that being said, with the end of the Qing um, in 1911. Uh, and the, China's introduction um, into the Western international order, there no longer was the space for that ambiguity. Uh, and what you then had were actors on each side working assiduously um, to construct uh, uh, legal claims uh, to, to that status as part, in this case, part of China. Um, first the Republic of China, and subsequently the PRC. And for what it's worth, the Tibetans at the time um, didn't really know what to, were, were attempting to contribute to these discussions, um, but were in some ways even more marginalized than the Chinese were. So China's coming into an order that's not their own. Tibet is on the margins of China, and the Tibetans then, uh, as for example, my research that was done by uh, a former PhD student of mine, Amanda Cheney, uh, who now has a postdoc at the Lund, showed um, the Tibetans didn't even have some of the words at the time to explain or to, to describe how they thought they fit into this new world. Um, for the early usage of the, for, for instance, the, the Tibetan word uh, rangzen, which is independence, Rangzen, when it was first being used in, around the time of the Simla Convention in uh, 1913, 1914, um, was translated by the Tibetans sometimes as independence, sometimes as autonomy, sometimes as something else. And now that term, though, is clear to any Tibetan when you say Rangzen. Or if you use the term Rangzen in a public demonstration, for example, in, within the TAR, um, everyone else knows what you mean, too, and you're not going to fare very well. Okay, but, but that's a term that we now know, it's understood as politically charged, but in this period when we're moving from a dynastic order into the Westphalian order, it was sort of indeterminate, or at least up in the air and ambiguous. Um, China um, was in a superior position. It was an asymmetrical relationship, right? The Tibetans uh, in the 1920s and 1930s under the 13th Dalai Lama um, were somewhat in chaos just on their own. Uh, in regards to whether Tibet was going to modernize, uh, heavy contestation uh, between various monasteries and uh, orders within Tibetan Buddhism, a lot of internal strife, uh, I mean, in uncertainty about how to respond to becoming part of the outside world. The peers, uh, the China itself is in a civil war, um, right, between uh, the KMT and CCP, uh, which ultimately the CCP wins in the late 1940s. Um, and through the 30s and 40s, though, again, there's, there's kind of, Tibet, again, is sitting in this ambiguous position as sort of both being a part of whatever China was becoming, but also not fitting in particularly well um, to that. That ambiguity, and then we'll, we'll, we'll move forward from there, ends quite quickly after the establishment of the PRC in 1949. Um, yeah, at Mao, right, we know stands uh, in Tiananmen and talks about the Chinese people having stood up. Um, at that point, in October of 1949, actually, Tibet, the, what becomes the Tibetan Autonomous Region, was still outside of CCP control. Um, it was basically the last region of what we now know as the People's Republic of China um, that the PLA entered into and was able to take control over. Um, so Mao stands up. China has, or Mao is in, in Tiananmen and China has stood up. Uh, one of the first military campaigns that then takes place at the establishment of the PRC is moving into the Tibetan region, both to assert control over Tibet and also due to concerns about remnants of the KMT that may have still been in the area and further south. Deng Xiaoping actually is the leader of this military campaign, uh, and it goes quite, quite smoothly um, th over the course of, 19, of 1950. Uh, actually, minimal resistance on the part of Tibetans. We could even talk a little bit about why it was so easy um, for China to move into Tibet or for the PRC to move into Tibet in 1950. Um, but, but that's a, maybe a detail that we can leave aside for the time being. Um, regardless, um, 
through this movement. Oh, and also, by the way, uh, in Chinese, um, uh, in the Chinese orthodoxy, this is not a military campaign, but peaceful liberation of Tibet. Kuoping Jiafang, right? Um, and, and, and there is, again, a degree of truth in that claim, in that initially the Tibetans, again, were divided about how to respond to um, their inter in their interactions with the PLA in 1950. By uh, the end of 1950, um, uh, the PLA has established control over much of uh, Tibet. And uh, in 1951, then, we get the signing of the 17-point agreement uh, between um, the Dalai Lama uh, and Mao. The Dalai Lama himself does not go to sign the agreement. Actually, it ends up being signed um, by Nakpo uh, Nyawang uh, Jimmy, who is um, uh, the kind of uh, leader of the uh, civilian government at the time. This is a photo of the signing of the, of the peaceful agreement, of the 17-point agreement. The core of this agreement is, essentially is that um, the, the Tibetans give up claims to independence in return for guarantees of a high level of autonomy um, uh, within uh, the Tibetan what will become the Tibetan Autonomous Region. The 17 point agreement also, and this uh, well, I'll show you in a couple of slides, um, solidifies what continues to be a contentious issue, um, that being what is Tibet? Uh, and where do its boundaries lie? Uh, not just within the international order, so Tibet is part of China, but how extensive Tibet is within the PRC itself. Uh, and uh, as Nick referred to, um, looking at in particular then the Tibetan Autonomous Region. So the 17 point agreement, the Tibetans are essentially saying, okay, we, there's not much we're gonna be able to do in terms of resisting what China is doing. Um, uh, but at the same time, we feel distinct enough to have a set of kind of demands that will allow us to preserve Tibetan language, culture, and the rest. Uh, and then also this issue of once more of how extensive the boundaries of uh, or what Tibet itself is. Um, anyways, 1951, the 17 point agreement, um, which establishes a temporary calm uh, between the Tibetan uh, and uh, the, the uh, central government in Beijing. Um, over the course of the 1950s, though, uh, and again, I'm happy in Q&A to go into more detail about what underlies these developments, but over the course of the 1950s, the agreement, which is signed here, um, t ends up being unsatisfactory to at least some living within Tibetan regions uh, in the PRC. Uh, in particular, uh, and I'm going to skip ahead the slide right now, just to kind of draw this out. Um, in particular, so 51 is the 17 point agreement. Uh, it establishes essentially the boundaries here of what in 1965 becomes known as the Tibetan Autonomous Region, the TAR. What it leaves out are culturally and linguistically two large areas. Um, which were historically part of whatever Tibet could have been considered. Uh, not clear that uh, here, Lhasa is the capital of the Yukon region of Tibet, historically. Up here, what is now Qinghai. How many people have been to Qinghai? Yes, okay. So in Qinghai, uh, historically, was the Amgo region of, of what was considered Tibet. Uh, the 14th Dalai Lama actually comes from Amgo. Um, and down here, roughly in this kind of area, uh, we have uh, the region which is referred to as Kham, uh, uh, where, uh, 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 which is now, for the most part, outside of the TAR. Anyways, the agreements here about kind of leaving Tibet alone, giving it autonomy out of the 17 point agreement, didn't extend um, to these regions outside of what becomes the Tibetan Autonomous Region. This appears to have been than the cause of unrest, particularly in Kham, starting in the mid-1950s, 1955, 1956. Uh, and uh, you begin to have fighting uh, between those in Kham um, and uh, Chinese officials and the Chinese military. Um, uh, between 1956 and 1959, um, this, uh, this uh, 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 resistance picks up and 
actually you begin to have a number of refugees coming from areas where there is conflict into Lhasa, uh, which then politicized Lhasa uh, in a way that had previously not been the case. Um, and uh, this culminates in March of 1959 uh, with what is known as the Lhasa Uprising uh, and uh, the flight of the Dalai Lama uh, to India, uh, where he has now uh, resided for decades, right, um, after being in government, gives them this little, him this little parcel of land up in, um, the, in uh, northern India, in Dharamsala. Has anyone been to Dharamsala? Me too, a long time ago, very long time ago. Actually, when I was in Dharamsala when I was very, very young, about your age, um, I, I met Richard Gere. He's the one celebrity I've ever met. So this was before he, at the Oscars he gave his speech about um, Tibet and the rest of it. He, he's, been a, he's been a devout Buddhist for a very, very long time. And the thing in Dharamsala, it's a very small town, particularly at the time, was you were supposed to act as if he wasn't Richard Gere, right? Like everyone's there just practicing Buddhism and the rest of it. Um, and so we're in this pancake house and Richard Gere was sitting next to me. And I thought, oh my God. And I, don't, I haven't met another Hollywood celebrity since, um, but I met, I met him. Well, I at least saw him. I at least was in the room with him, right? <laughs> um, anyways, um, so in 59, in March, and March 10th then becomes this kind of charged symbolic date um, in Sino-Tibetan relations. Pretty much anything big that happens with Tibet after this date is going to happen on March 10th. The Tibetans are, are well aware of this. It's, it's, it, this March 10th is not the day that Dalai Lama actually leaves Tibet, but it's the start of this um, uprising in Lhasa, uh, which results in extensive fighting, his departure, um, in his autobiography, his, his departure from Tibet is treated as almost magical. It's almost like he flew out of Tibet. Um, subsequent research, which has been done, especially since more archival stuff has been opened up, has made it pretty, pretty clear um, that the CIA um, was helping uh, extensively with his departure. Right? Um, so the, the, the narrative here is the Dalai Lama almost walks over the clouds. In truth, there's a lot of logistical support which is going on. Actually, after 59, we continue to, the US government continues to support the Tibetan um, opposition in a variety of ways. Uh, in, in actually, um, for what it's worth, Cornell played a tiny role um, in that resistance in that um, some of the guerrilla fighters who were largely accomplice um, who came to the US, their military training was received um, out in Colorado, I think in Fort Hale. Um, but um, they learned English here um, uh, on campus for a, a short period of time. I'm sure um, Cornell probably doesn't want people to talk about that um, <laughs> right now. Um, I'm trying to find like the records of this, and it's in a book about uh, Tibet and the Cold War. I've never, I haven't found like notes and stuff, but apparently it, this did go on. Um, 59 then is, is hugely significant, right? So if we're looking at dates, 51 is a sort of, we're gonna be able to get along. 17 point agreement. 59 is the end of that facade. Okay? And in all nationalist disputes, history, the past is always present, right? And so in this case, 59 stands out as a seminal date, uh, March 10th, and I think the seminal date for those within Tibet itself and in the Tibetan diaspora, because it's when the Dalai Lama leaves. Okay? Um, after 1959, um, I'm just going to entirely, um, well, I'll get there. Um, oops, oops. So 59 uprising, um, again, this slide is an entire course, maybe not a course, that's probably too much, um, but at least it's a, it's a lecture in and of itself. So um, a lot, Tibet is contested, Tibet, or Tibet is contested internationally, where does it stand? And then the out external boundaries or international boundaries of this part of the PRC are also contested, in particular in this case by India. Um, so to this day, China and India have an outstanding border dispute um, over the, 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 all three sections, but particularly the eastern, western, and central section, but particularly the eastern and western sections of their border. Um, and in 1962, uh, went to war um, over the location of the boundary uh, in this place. Um, this is um, related also, though, to the Tibetan question. Um, 
some of the debate about where the boundary lies here goes back to this the Simla Convention uh, of 1914 and where everyone ends up being um, located. But the border, this is a contested border. And the Dalai Lama from 1959 onward is living in India that has a border con uh, 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 a conflict with uh, 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 the PRC. Anyways, um, in 1965, uh, you get the establishment of the Shizang Zidruchu, or the Tibetan Autonomous Region. Um, again, the groundwork for this was set in the 17-point agreement in 1951. A preparatory committee was established in 56, um, and the TAR was meant to be established prior to the 1959 uprising. Uh, it takes until um, 1965 uh, to be established, um, and uh, this is essentially on the eve of the Cultural Revolution as well. I, in, when I first started giving lectures in about decade, a couple of decades ago, <laughs> um, I spent a great deal of time on the Cultural Revolution and its impact on Tibet. We could talk about that later, but I'm leaving it out of today because I do want to get to the uh, more recent issues as soon as we can. Um, this then, though, is the, the, polit the, the political structure of uh, the Tibetan Autonomous Region falls within this, the, this framework. And what you then have is, um, Within the Tibetan Autonomous Region, the TAR government itself has a chairman uh, who has always been ethnically Tibetan. This is also the case um, in other autonomous regions uh, within the PRC. Um, but real power has lied with the TAR um, the, a party secretary, um, so the CCP, T, uh, CPC committee secretaries. And uh, when we look at recent changes in uh, policy towards Tibet, these uh, party secretaries play a particularly significant role. And there's one, uh, and, uh, especially who I want to call attention to in a few moments, uh, who you should remember. There's a couple, there's maybe three or four things to really take away from the talk. One is the pomegranate seed reference by Xi. Another is uh, Chen Chuanguo, uh, who is, was the party secretary from um, 2011 to 2016, if my date's right. Uh, and a couple other things too, but we'll get there in a moment. Okay, so this is the TAR. Um, under Deng Xiaoping, um, uh, in, uh, beginning in 1979, this photo is from earlier. This is Deng um, accompanying um, uh, Napo Nawang Jingmi um, on his way to Beijing to give peace talks. Um, but what you essentially have under Dong, as you have in the rest of the country, is an acknowledgement of some of the mistakes that were made under Mao and an attempt to become a bit more pragmatic in approaching um, uh, to polit political and economic issues. Uh, for, uh, Tibet, or for the TAR, what this means uh, more specifically, uh, kind of two things. Um, one in 79, um, uh, very early after Dong um, is, uh, uh, kind of reaches his role as a paramount leader, um, he uh, sends out an invitation uh, to not the Dalai Lama himself, um, but to Dharamsala to allow a delegation from the diaspora to come into the PRC to kind of examine how conditions within Tibet. Okay? This is in 79. Um, the two delegations end up coming in 79 and 1980. Um, they, it kind of backfires, though, from Beijing's perspective, um, in that uh, Deng had felt that these delegations would come. They would say, oh, things are great, uh, and maybe the Dalai Lama could come back, and there's no need to have any sort of a conflict anymore. In contrast, the delegations um, were received um, as if they were um, sort of affiliated to the Dalai Lama and led to an outpouring of public support for the Dalai Lama in a way that greatly embarrassed uh, Deng. Uh, and so after those first two visits, we don't get any more delegations going on. Um, but it was a sign of a kind of more flexible policy being instituted. In addition, restrictions on monastic activity, uh, which had been put in place during the Cultural Revolution, were lessened. Uh, the monasteries which had been destroyed were allowed to be rebuilt. Um, there was a, 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 no longer a prohibition against uh, the practice of Tibetan Buddhism in public. Um, so this would be, again, if we're talking about, and the theme here is assimilation versus autonomy, this is a period where 
the Chinese government was experimenting with granting a higher level of autonomy to this region, not for, uh, not, not simply to kind of because they were feeling good, um, but rather with the idea that this would be a more effective policy. That assimilation was created, created blowback and resentment, uh, and in contrast to autonomy, the idea of granting autonomy is that with autonomy you'll develop a higher level of legitimacy for Chinese rule. We're giving you space to do what you want, then you accept the rules that we're giving you. All right? um, and it appeared in the beginning, in the first part of the 1980s that this was working, um, but the, the kind of, the, the struggle for Beijing when it comes to Tibet, ever since the, um, the flight of the Dalai Lama and even earlier, is that Tibetan political institutions and religious institutions are so deeply intertwined. Um, and so to restrict religious behavior has then impacts on people's political idea, um, uh, values and ideas and vice versa. Um, so by the late 1980s, um, things in Tibet begin to, to shape up in a new way. First of all, uh, in uh, 1987, uh, on, in September of 1987, the Dalai Lama uh, made his first political speech in the United States to the Congressional Human Rights Caucus. Uh, caucus. Um, this was, the Dalai Lama had been to the U.S. before, starting in 1979, but this is the beginning of him taking a much higher profile role uh, within uh, uh, U.S. politics. Um, this is then um, associated with uh, a rise of protest, a cycle of protest uh, within the TAR. Uh, this photo is one of the more kind of iconic photos uh, about Tibet um, that you'll find. I think like if you Google um, Tibet and Tibetan protest, um, this photo comes up. It's of a monk, uh, Jampa Tenzin, uh, who was um, amongst protesters in the Tibetan capital of Lhasa in 1987. Um, uh, raising his fist and, and presumably sh shouting out something like Rangza, right, again, independence. Um, this 87-89 period is the, the, uh, uh, the, the, the time in which there is the highest level of public expression of resistance to Chinese rule in Tibet um, since 1959, and there's been nothing comparable to it since then. I'll talk in a little bit about uh, the 2008 um, uh, uh, incident and also the self-immolations that have been taking place. But this is clearly like the high tide of, 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 of a public opposition to the PA, uh, to Chinese rule over Tibet. Uh, it's led by the monastic community and unfolds largely through the, the making use of everyday religious practices for political purposes. Um, so for example, between 87 and 89, there's somewhere between 20 to 30 demonstrations which take place uh, within Tibet and Tibetan regions within, uh, in the PRC. The vast majority of these demonstrations actually are starting with, not just monks leading them, but through monks carrying out, again, sort of everyday religious practices. Uh, Serpentinization, for example, is uh, one of the core kind of everyday um, practices in Tibetan religion, so going around a temple um, or a monastery in order to collect merit. It's supposed to kind of be uh, to help you uh, in, in the next life, right? So everyone does this. Um, if everyone's doing it, and then in the midst of that everyday practice, there, you begin to shout out political slogans, um, that's then kind of taking in this religious corrupt practice and making it into something more. Uh, and these 87 and 89 demonstrations were very much um, in that vein. Um, they uh, were spurred in part by the Dalai Lama's more public presence uh, uh, in, on the international stage, um, and at the same time were an unintended consequence of this partial reforms, of the partial reforms that Dong and Huyabang had instituted in the early 80s. So they, what had happened from those reforms was an opening up of religious space, which then made it possible for monks not only to practice their religion, but also to organize um, a social movement uh, in opposition to Chinese rule, which was then generally supported by the lay population as well. Um, 
In 1988, um, the Dalai Lama, in the midst of all of this, uh, goes to the European Parliament uh, and makes uh, what he called what ends up being called the Strasbourg Proposal, um, or uh, has not, which is kind of the core of what's considered the middle way for Tibet. Um, this is June of 1988. He, in this statement, says, the whole of Tibet, known as Jolka Sam, which is Yutsam Kham and Amdo, should become a self-governing democratic political entity funded on law by agreement of the people for the common good and their protection of themselves and their environment. Here's the key line uh, the, the, within this. And he, also, he adds, in association with, in association with the People's Republic of China. So the Dalai Lama, uh, who has now been in exile for decades, in 88, despite the fact that some within the diaspora are calling for independence and a stronger stand, and even the demonstrators within Tibet are looking for something more than autonomy, he doesn't endorse the 17-point agreement. He doesn't endorse the TAR specifically, but he does say that whatever this is going to be, whatever Tibet is going to be, will be in association with the People's Republic of China. This is a non-starter for Beijing. It goes nowhere, okay? On the, on the face of it, it would seem like this is a, a, a fairly moderate position, right? No independence, working with um, the, the People's Republic of China. Um, Beijing rejects it for two reasons. One, they see it as disingenuous, feeling that he is not really talking about um, uh, accepting autonomy, but is somehow trying to kind of cloak a, a, or, or cover, or come up with a ruse to create greater independence. And secondly, because it, the state of the Strasbourg proposal is not just about the TAR, it's about this histo historically what was considered Tibet. Uh, and though that, though that really ends up being a sticking point in subsequent negotiations between the two sides. So the demonstrations are ongoing. The Dalai Lama is making these proposals. And then, hopefully, some of you will recognize who this is. Who is Hu Jintao? Who is who? Someone? Yes. Was he the previous president? Yes. Before Xi Jinping, he was China's leader. Uh, and before he became party secretary and president of China, uh, he was also then the party secretary of Tibet um, between 1988 and 1992. So he's actually brought in to the TAR to bring an end to these riots and demonstrations. Um, and arguably, the degree to which he effectively does that um, becomes a major stepping stone in his career um, moving forward. But who might not have become party secretary if he hadn't done his time in Tibet and, done, and accomplished what Beijing wanted so effectively. So he's coming in, not the, if he started in 86 or 85 and these demonstrations occurred, that probably wouldn't look that good for him. In contrast, he's coming in towards the end of them um, and helps to bring them under control. This is done through a declaration of martial law in Lhasa on March 8th of 1989. Uh, which lasts through May of 1990. In signing the end of this uh, de declaration of martial law uh, in uh, Li Peng, um, stated, in view of the fact that the situation in the city of Lhasa has become stable and social order has returned to normal, the task of enforcing martial law in the city has been successfully fulfilled. Um, so uh, what's done, uh, by the way, the Dalai Lama then wins a Nobel Peace Prize uh, uh, in uh, the fall of 1989 um, and continues um, with uh, his relationship with uh, the U.S. government by visiting uh, George H.W. Bush uh, in April of 1991. And this is the first time the Dalai Lama meets with an American president. So he'd been to Congress in 87, um, with, meets with Bush in 91, subsequently meets with each American president um, to date. Um, he has not met with President Trump, um, and I would think the odds of him meeting with President Trump are fairly long. Um, but who knows, the world is crazy. He, uh, before Trump was elected, he uh, went on, I think it was Charlie Rose's show or someone, um, 
and uh, gave an interview where he made quite a bit of fun, actually, of the president in a very, like, kind of good-natured Dalai Lama way, but he does this thing where he took his hand down and went, doo -doo 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 -doo, and that was his trunk um, with the hair falling over. Um, if you have like a minute, Google Dalai Lama and Trump, you'll find the video. It's it's just it's it's a, it's kind of wonderful. Um, I don't think the if the president has seen it that he'll sit down uh, with the Dalai Lama. Um, now moving quickly, um, essentially then, so that was all background, but you need to know the background again because past this present and his struggles, and it's going to be the same thing in Xinjiang. Um, I don't know the Xinjiang material like Magnus does here, um, but in all of these cases, you have these moments in the past which, which don't only, not only are not forgotten, become loaded with symbolic significance, whether it's dates or locations um, or specific terminology. Um, here, though, what we're seeing, and this is when I wrote my book, this was the Tibet that, that, that seemed to be, what the, there seemed to be a status quo which had emerged which is you had these demonstrations in 87 89. We knew that at least, particularly the Tibetan uh, monastic population, the lay population as well, was not especially satisfied with being part of China. Um, but the Chinese government had established effective control over the TAR. And that control was established through silencing dissent. Uh, uh, and this is then through the use of surveillance, um, uh, um, de uh, detentions, we can get other sorts of unsavory behaviors, but we'll just silencing dissent, but you can understand what's entailed in that, right? So, and, and we're able to then control public space. After 89, for almost two decades, you don't have any, there's no noise coming out of Tibet. This is, there's a difference though between control and authority. So this policy of silencing dissent and spurring development, so you have Mass, a massive um, uh, influx of capital in the form of the infrastructure projects, economic incentives, uh, the Tibetan economy begins to develop rather rapidly. So development and silencing dissent, which, which actually is, is kind of the formula for um, the PRC in general, right, after 1989. And it's worked in Han areas fairly effectively since then. Eli can talk about labor unrest and other people, but, but overall, this isn't a particularly, this isn't like something that Beijing comes up with, that Jiang Zemin comes up with just for Tibet. This is the Chinese government. Keep people, keep the troublemakers quiet, and there aren't a lot, and also you can kind of vilify the troublemakers as being unpatriotic and all the rest of it, so talking about democracy then isn't about talking about kind of a human right, it's about being a, a bad, bad Chinese, right? It's about being anti-government. Um, and making sure that the economy keeps rolling forward. And again, this is, it, it, it works to a degree. And it, you see this, for example, in the first white paper in Tibet in September 1992, uh, which I spent a lot, way more time with. If you ever have a hard time falling asleep, reading uh, Chinese white papers is a good way. Um, so just pick one up in English or Chinese and start thumbing through them and you'll, you'll have no better than any sort of sleeping pill, right? Um, this is the first white paper on Tibet. I think it's actually the second white paper um, that uh, China publishes after its first on human rights. Uh, and it was a kind of a big deal that at least uh, Beijing was talking to the world about what was going on within Tibet, but it was a very kind of uh, defensive white paper and saying what's going on in Tibet is all good. There are no problems here, nothing to see here, um, like Kevin Bacon at the end of Animal House. Um, in subsequent white papers, the same theme is developed, um, new progress on human rights in Tibet, and Tibet marches toward modernization. So new progress in human rights, this is not saying we're silencing dissent, but this is essentially saying there's no human rights problems here, and there's no human rights problems here because we've gotten rid of all the troublemakers. Um, and we're marching forward, the, the kind of on the arc of history, going in the right direction. Um, under uh, Guo Jinlong, uh, who's the TAR party secretary um, from 2000-2004, I would say this is one of the kind of high tides of this kind of, things are quiet, we're developing the region, nothing to see here. 
Uh, and in particular, then, one of the, ma the largest of the infrastructure projects um, which is uh, developed um, is a railway line which goes then from Xining and Qinghai uh, to Lhasa itself, uh, which actually through uh, the late 1990s had been considered um, uh, kind of, uh, impossible to complete that, uh, in terms of uh, engineering. Um, much of this railway is on permafrost, uh, and in this, it was in areas that, thought you, that it was thought you couldn't build a railway line. And it's pretty remarkable, just in terms of engineering, that it was completed. Um, and uh, Guo was a main part of kind of driving that through. It's not, it finishes after his term, but his, this is kind of, again, the, the old approach to Tibet, which was not allowing for Tibetan independence, not at all, but saying autonomy works, especially if we get rid of the troublemakers and we kind of are paying you off. Okay, that's the old line, and it appeared to work. The Dalai Lama, meanwhile, um, this, I just, I wanted to include this just because the, the world is crazy sometimes. Um, so George W. Bush, um, who, who gave an amazing eulogy to his father, um, actually, um, last year, um, which, which was remarkable to sort of see. Um, turns out that he always wanted to be a painter. I don't know if he always wanted to be a painter, but what he's largely been doing since he stepped down from office is painting. And he paints people he met. And he's painted the Dalai Lama. Apparently, he actually kind of quite loves and adores the Dalai Lama, George W. Bush. Talks about him extremely fondly. And the Dalai Lama, as it wouldn't be surprising, he talks fondly about George W. Bush, too, right? I mean, the Dalai Lama, what is, the Dalai Lama has not a bad word to say about anyone, okay? Um, I've, I've met him a couple of times, many, many years ago, um, and, and I do have to say that he is an incredibly charismatic and engaging individual. I don't know what happens in the afterlife or in other lives, um, but it, there is something about this him uh, which does seem to be rather special. Uh, and certainly he's captured the attention of George W. Bush. Um, and this is significant to the Tibetan Policy Act of 2002 because on, with Bush's support, and um, this is a, a bill which goes through Congress, uh, which commits the United States to, um, I need to look up the specific language here. Oops, sorry. Oh, forget it. I'm not going to find it. Um, but commits the United States um, to um, uh, both China and the Tibetans have to be committed to dialogue between the two sides. Uh, and it also establishes within the State Department a position um, uh, of sort of undersecretary for Tibetan affairs. So this makes, uh, this formalizes U.S. policy on Tibet. Uh, and China is not at all happy about this. Interference in internal affairs, violation of Chinese sovereignty and territorial integrity, creates all sorts of, of noise. What's fascinating is in contrast, uh, just in the fall, another bill passed through Congress and Trump signed it, um, which uh, related to that and this reciprocal access, and China essentially shrugged its shoulders. So 2002, this infuriates Beijing. 2018, China doesn't really care. And, and I'll get to, I think, a little bit why in a moment. Um, in 2003, 2004, you have more white papers, and then uh, Yen, Yen, Yang Chen Tuang um, is party secretary, who's also considered somewhat moderate. Uh, and this leads to uh, the, uh, the, this quote, um, there's a meeting between representatives of the Dalai Lama uh, that Xi Zan Qing Shi Ren Hao, Gen Ben Bu Sun Zai, Shema Xi Zan Wen Ti, right? There's no Tibet problem, no Tibet issue. Nothing to see here. And again, that's when I was writing before. This shifts, though, fairly quickly. I'm going to just go straight to here. Uh, in March of 2008, when you have unrest in Lhasa, um, and how you term this, is it Salman? Is it a riot? Um, or is it an incident? Or is it a demonstration? Or is it a protest? Um, whatever it was, it was it, what it resulted in, it was... Um, uh, a real challenge to Beijing's assumption that there was no Xi Zhang Wen Ti. In, two th in 2004, you could say this, there's no Tibet problem. Ch China's leaders today will still say, there's no Tibet problem, no Tibet issue. 2008 blew that myth up, though. Okay? It's only two or three days of demonstrations and riots. 
not particularly organized um, as were the 87-89 um, protests. Uh, the monastic community was involved but not central to it. Uh, the most kind of visible aspect of these um, of this incident uh, was Tibetans within Lhasa uh, attacking Han establishments, uh, restaurants, um, other sorts of, uh, of, of Han-owned enterprises, uh, and it results in um, some deaths uh, and a number of, of casualties as well. Um, and is taking place at the same time the party congress was meeting uh, in Beijing itself. Actually, at the, the party secretary at the time of Tibet um, was not in Lhasa. Um, and there's a whole interesting set of discussions about then why the, the, this sort of rioting lasts for three days. Um, and probably it lasts in part because Beijing was caught off guard and the leadership wasn't there. It's also taking place um, against the backdrop of the lead up to the uh, 2008 Summer Olympics. Uh, and so you had these, this short lived two, three days of rioting within uh, Lhasa itself, followed by um, demonstrations uh, around the, um, the Olympic torch, uh, which is being carried around the world to go to Beijing at the end of the summer. Uh, and so the, attracting both supporters of Tibet um, and supporters, excuse me, of China's position um, as well. It was exceptionally contentious. Actually, the last time on campus that I talked about Tibet was uh, in the middle of all of this. Um, and it, there was all sorts of kind of, uh, it was a very charged environment, I'd say. Um, the question then is, OK, so through the, through the 1990s and the first part of the 2000s, development in some sense the sense Descent resulted in control. Beijing felt it, it was its position in Tibet was solid. We can talk about why Tibet is so important to, uh, to China, um, but but the policy line had been fairly uh, appeared to be fairly successful. Now there is a reconsideration of this uh, kind of granting of limited autonomy, um, and the question becomes: Do you double down? on assimilation, or do you go with autonomy itself? Um, this is followed then by a, a significant amount of writing coming out of the Chinese uh, ma uh, national minority establishment, uh, in, here in the form of, uh, of writings which become known as Diar Dai Minzu Zhongse, or, or the second generation minority na uh, nationality policy, uh, which is led um, by people like Ma Rong, uh, at Bei Da, who's a sociologist, um, and also Huang Gang and Hu Lianhe, uh, writing, um, uh, 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 I think uh, Huang Gang at least is at Qinghai, I can't remember who, where Hu Lianhe is. But they're, they're sort of, and this is where using Chinese sources becomes really interesting. In English, this discussion is not unavailable. In Chinese, beginning in 2008, 2009, you have this kind of no no one whether it's uh, any whether it's Marong or who or who they're not they're not sort of saying we failed, but they're saying we need to reconsider how we're governing these non Han regions uh, within the PRC, um, and there are three main developments then that weigh the scales in favor of assimilation. First is the appointment, and again, this is one of the people I want you to remember. So the Shangshu Liaozi, right? So like um, the pomegranate seeds. Uh, Chen Chuanguo, uh, who's party secretary from 2011 to 2016, really takes the lead in uh, pushing for a more assimilationist approach um, to uh, minorities in general and Tibet more specifically. Uh, Chen is, I'm just, let me find my notes real quickly. Uh, Chen is from Hunan province uh, and um, had be served as uh, party secretary of Hebei um, before becoming party secretary of Tibet in 2011. Uh, during his time there, he really places an emphasis on surveillance and control. Uh, and um, after his time in Tibet, uh, Magnus would be quite familiar uh, with uh, where he ends up. Uh, he becomes party secretary of Xinjiang. Uh, and what, what's interesting to look at is the degree to which some of the policies which are being carried out in Xinjiang now uh, were first instituted in Tibet on Chen. Um, surveillance, detention of a couple of friends who had family members who were detained in Tibet on Chen. Um, so there is um, 
um, a pattern of behavior here where Shen, whether it's on his own initiative um, or carrying out orders, is really pushing a more assimilationist approach to governing a non han region. Uh, and the, the, the extent to which he's using these policies in Tibet are probably less than in Xinjiang for a variety of reasons, um, but there are real similarities uh, in the approach. So Chen is a particularly important figure um, in uh, minority policy within China over the past um, seven or eight years. So his appointment uh, is one of the things that weighs in the direction of assimilation. Secondly, the Dalai Lama, who has been a constant in PRC policy, in 2011 announces um, that he is stepping down from all political positions. Um, and this then, I think, in terms of the move toward assimilation, Beijing is, it, it kind of puts to the forefront the fact that the Dalai Lama, the current Dalai Lama, um, is uh, not, no, not always going to be around. Um, and so I think up until 2011, there had been a sense that the Dalai Lama was central to, to Chinese policy and Tibet at least they had to deal with him. And now there's a question of what will Tibet policy look like after he steps down from his position of political authority. Um, third, between 2011 and 2013, you have a wave of self-immolations in Tibet. Um, this is a painting by Tashi Norby, um, who is a Tibetan artist based in Amsterdam. Um, and it, I, it was on, um, on her website, and she writes, the work expresses the dual hope that the self-immolator's sac immolator sacrifice will lead to the religious realization of ultimate reality through burning away ignorance and also burn away the conventional reality of oppression. I'm not gonna show that there are vivid um, images of self-immolations which occur, um, but, but I think this actually kind of is a little bit more um, palatable. Um, I will add, though, that the um, various Tibet organizations keep, uh, that have kept track of this have reported that there have been, a, this, and just this number is, is unbelievable, 155 people have self-immolated uh, since 2009. And, and just self-immolate is kind of, you know, that doesn't sound so horrible. It's horrible. Um, but what that means is these people have lit themselves on fire which is historically unprecedented. Self-immolation as a form of political protest has occurred at various points of time in various places, most notably in Vietnam uh, during the war with the United States and with France. Um, these, this number of self-immolations, I, I, at least in my preliminary research, there's nothing like this which has occurred any place else in the world over time. Okay. They largely are taking place between 2011 and 2013, though. Um, the first is 2009, but really focused during this period. Um, in 2000, and um, in 2012, for example, 86 self-immolations occur. Um, the self-immolations are concentrated. This map um, uh, from uh, uh, the, uh, the Tibet, I forget if it's um, one of the Tibetan organizations demonstrates the geographic distribution of the self-immolations, and you'll note that the vast majority are occurring actually outside of the TAR itself. Um, again, we could talk at great length about this, but just to kind of quickly go through. Beijing's response um, is this uh, uh, regulation, Guan Yu Fan Zi Fan Gong Zuo Zhan Hang Gui Ding De Tong Gao. So the notice on interim provisions on anti-self-immolation work, which goes beyond saying that self-immolation is illegal to establishing a legal framework to penalize anyone associated with someone who self-immolates. So the, the set of provisions relate to the type of punishments which will be meted out to those who are affiliated with self-immolators. Uh, the institution of this policy seems to have been, uh, has effectively ended the wave of self-immolations. A few still occurred, a couple occurred last year. Um, but this really kind of uh, stopped things. Alongside of it, you begin to get, again, this kind of hardening of China's position on what it is to be Chinese. Um, mm -hmm. So, for example, here, this is an article that uh, Huang Gang and Hu Lianhe um, published, where they talk about, uh, where it's just entitled, Zhongguo Meng de Ji Shi Shi Zhonghua Minzu de Guozu Yi Ti Hua. 
So the English translation of this article, which, which they forward in the journal, is China Dream. It belongs to everyone in the Chinese nation. But I, that seems like a loose translation at best. That seems like the most favorable way of translating things, right? Um, so so um, one could, uh, well, we don't have time for a joke, but here in particular, that the latter part of it, um, so the iti hua, right? The kind of coming together um, emphasis, which is drawn out more in subsequent statements. This is under Xi Jinping, uh, who becomes uh, party secretary in November of 2012 and president of the PRC in March of 2013. So between 2013 and 2017, she issues a number of statements which really emphasize assimilation and control. Uh, one of the most uh, significant of these is uh, a, a quote which he, uh, uh, which he says in 2013, uh, So um, to govern the country, you have to control or govern the borders. And to govern the borders or control the borders, um, you need then to stabilize Tibet. This becomes like kind of the, the, the guiding principle um, for uh, Beijing's approach to Tibet in subsequent years. It comes out, for example, in uh, 2014 in the Fourth Nationalized Work Forum, which produces the guidelines talking about gong ti hua, right? So community or belonging, uh, and the emphasis again and again on Zhonghua Minzu, or the Chinese people or Chinese nation, it's not even, there's not a single sort of translation of Zhonghua Minzu. Uh, it can go sort of different ways. Uh, and in addition, this emphasis on Ge Minzu, Zhao Wang, Zhao Liu, Zhao Rong, okay? And so Zhao Wang is just kind of moving back and forth, right? Zhao Liu is exchange of information, right? And, and many of you who's making like even kind of basic Chinese, like Zhao Liu, Zhao Liu, right? Like just let's talk, we'll talk it out, we'll discuss. Zhao Rong is a different term. Zhao Rong is intermingling or mixing, right? And in this case, it really is about um, kind of uh, lessening distinctions between uh, ethnic groups within China and draw, draw, uh, drawing um, minorities away from thinking of themselves as particularly distinct. Zhao Rong is, um, creates an opening for a heavier emphasis on assimilation than had previously been, been, been the case. And all these things kind of fit together into the way policy is, ends up being enacted. August 15, at the sixth meeting of the Tibet Work Forum, you get these wuga rentong, which I'm calling recognitions I spent more time actually trying to figure out how I wanted to translate, translate Wuga Rentong than anything else in these slides. Uh, Rentong on, on some level is like identity, right? You can talk about what your Rentong is. He, I, I don't, and, and we also have like sang, the Sangha Dadya, right? Like the three represents. But Rentong isn't represent, it's also not identity in this case. I think recognitions work. And so the guiding principles of ethnic work, right, are Rentong or recognizing Wei Da Zhuguo, the great motherland, Zhonghua uh, Minzu, the Chinese people, Zhonghua Wenhua, the Chinese culture, Zhonghua Gongchang Dang, the CCP, and Zhonghua Tse Shi Hui Jui, Chinese socialism. This shows up in white papers and then it begins to materialize in policy. Okay? So, uh, La Rungar uh, is this uh, massive monastic uh, structure outside of the Tibetan Autonomous Region. At its high point, there was an argument that upwards of 40,000 uh, monks and nuns uh, were living in La Rongar. Uh, in 2015, 2016, uh, there is a drive um, to reduce that population and to modernize La Rongar uh, to make it more sanitary and developed. Um, the, those who lived there didn't necessarily see this as a modernization drive. Uh, they saw it as an attempt to kind of shut the area down. Um, alongside of this, you have the detention of Tashi Wangchuk, uh, who is a linguist who talks about the need to preserve Tibetan language. He does a video with the New York Times, uh, which ends up uh, with him being detained um, as a result of that. The National Work uh, People's uh, Work Congress report, sorry. Okay, this is new stuff for me, so I have all this material, and I know this is taking too long, so I'm going to quickly go through the last parts of it. Here, it's at the 19th Party Congress where she come, uh, comes out with a statement of 
uh, na the m nationalities, the people of China need to hold together uh, So the Chinese nation or people need to hold, uh, I'm sorry, the, the, the people need to hold together. This is the next quote. He also talks about there's already been um, integration of the Chinese people. In a letter published in uh, Xinhua in 2017, um, he writes, uh, this seems like it could come straight from President Trump, right? Um, this emphasis on borders uh, and the need for borders to have peace. Uh, in fact, some of Trump's anti-immigration policies have kind of echoed within Chinese cyberspace in interesting ways and been picked up in, uh, particularly like in Guangzhou, questions of illegal immigrants, particularly Africans, uh, and uh, the degree to which um, the Chinese government has dealt with them in contrast to what's seen as Trump's effective policies and a further hardening of China's position in analysis published within the minority establishment. Here, um, th this is actually the core of the work that I'm doing. It's not necessarily super interesting in terms of learning about the, uh, what's going on uh, in Tibet, but uh, in the work of Ma Rong, uh, Chen Zhen, and Du, du Ganzhu, uh, Ga Sanjia, and Ren Qing um, there is a series of writings which pick up upon these general themes of assimilation uh, and the, the five recognitions, the Wuga Rentong, and argue that Tibet, the, the legitimate practice of Tibetan Buddhism, or Tibetan Buddhism can only be legitimately practiced when it incorporates those principles into those religious practices. And, and the argument in these articles is that, in fact, Tibetan Buddhism has always been sinified, always draws upon actually the way Buddhism is practiced in China, and to ignore that is essentially a perversion or an unorthodox version of what Buddhism itself is. Which is a pretty bold set of claims, right? This is the first time, and this is where, where I'm, I have um, stuff I'm writing about, this is the first time that, ch that the Chinese state has looked to turn Tibetan Buddhism around, not to kind of push it down and say it shouldn't be practiced, but rather that if it's practiced, in the right way, which involves bowing to the central authorities in Beijing, then it's a wonderful practice and a great part of Tibetan culture. If, though, it does not include those five, rep those five recognitions of the motherland, of the party, and so forth, then it is splittist and also not real Buddhism, okay? So, so in a way, it's a recognition that policy to this point has failed because what the policy had been doing was changing the kind of outer trappings of Tibetan life without going to this core question of what Tibetan Buddhism is and how it is to be practiced. Um, subsequently, Tashi Wangjok was convicted for f in, uh, to five years in prison in May of 2008. And what you really have then um, in terms of this signification of Tibetan Buddhism um, drive in 2018, Li Keqiang and Wang Yang, uh, two of the, I mean, just a step below essentially Xi Jinping, right, in terms of authority, uh, both do visits to Tibet, both talk about Zhang Chuang Fu Jiao, the Zhongguo Hua or Zhongguo Hua. Both talk about sinification of Tibetan Buddhism on these trips and the need to sinify, the, the need to sinify Buddhism in Tibet in order um, to establish greater levels of stability and to then carry out Xi's mission of, or vision that the, the, the growth and stability of the country depends on stabilizing Tibet. And then finally, um, and we still have a little bit of time for discussion, what the future holds. Um, so in 2014, this is already a number of years ago, um, the Dalai Lama um, in an interview with the BBC said, whether the institution of the Dalai Lama should continue or not is up to the Tibetan people. There's no, guarantee, uh, this is, there's no guarantee some stupid Dalai Lama won't come next <laughs> who will disgrace himself or herself. That would be very sad. So much better that a centuries-old tradition should cease at the time of a quite popular Dalai Lama. So, so what, what I've tried to do here is cover a whole bunch of stuff to give you a picture of how we've gotten to where we are with Tibet. Tibet's, the, the relationship actually to what's going on in Tibet and to what is going on in Xinjiang but, but in fact, any one of these aspects of the talk 
um, re we could really dig into and discover a lot more with. And so this quote alone, right? Um, on the surface, it's this 80, at the time he was 80, he's 83 now, um, maybe, well, maybe whatever, 79. It's, an, it's, a, it's a 70 to 80 year old man just kind of just saying, oh, well, it, I've done well, I've been happy with my job, and things probably need to change. Just the adorable old Dalai Lama, right? Good for you, Dalai Lama. You're, you're so non-egocentric. You don't even need this institution to continue. But every single line here within this quote, some, the next Dalai Lama being some stupid Dalai Lama, being a him or a her, um, a centuries-old tradition should cease at the time of a quite popular Dalai Lama, all of that is loaded, absolutely loaded, both to the Tibetan diaspora Tibetans, to Tibetans living within the TAR and to Beijing. Um, where my research lands and where I hope you guys coming out of this talk will, will kind of um, hopefully build upon is um, we're in a time of potentially massive change within the Sino-Tibetan relationship. Even reincarnate lamas don't live forever. The Dalai Lama has made it clear that he is not going to himself. He's actually, I think, at this point, lived longer than any other previous Dalai Lama. One of, I think the fifth maybe lived until he was 65, if memory serves, although there's even some questions about when he passed away. Um, but whatever has gone on in Tibet, I think, is now can be considered sort of a prelude uh, to what will unfold in the coming years, uh, which um, I think that Beijing has really no idea what that will look like. I don't think the diaspora does either, and those in Tibet do uh, as well. And, as a, and I think as a result, it's going to be rather tumultuous and contentious. Um, and hopefully after this talk, you'll be more prepared to kind of make sense of those events as they unfold. Thank you.